Um, I started up again and it was like, these flowers were fascinating me. And it was, it was the center of the flower that was fascinating me. And it was, I just was zooming in on this daisy and there's the Fibonacci sequence. It, it's kind of like what a snail has yeah. and golden rule and all this kind of thing it's called. And it, it's just beautiful. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to episode 138 of the Camino Voice. Today, I speak to the featured artist of the month for May. Please welcome Denise Campin. Hi, I'm Brandon Erickson, and you're listening to the Camino Voice podcast, where I interview local business owners, comedians, singers, and more. I dive into their backstory to find out how they got where they are, what are some of the tips for you to do the same, and find out where they're going. Tune in every week as I interview more of the people you see every day. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Command of Voice, where we release a new episode every Tuesday. Uh, how is your guys' week going? I uh, hope it's going well. Um, had an interesting, or had a good week this week. Uh, my twin daughters turned 11, which is insane that they're that old, but there it is. Um, So we had a nice little birthday for them on their birthday, and then they've got a little birthday trip coming up here. Um, I also managed to put myself into shock with a vacuum cleaner. I don't know if many of you have ever done that. Uh, It's a pretty impressive feat, so I'm pretty proud of myself for that. Um, uh, And yeah, so that was my week in a nutshell. (laughs) Hope your guys' week is going well. Um, Anyways, today, uh, as I alluded to in the opener, um, I interviewed Denise Campen, who is the Featured Artist of the Month for May. And so if you guys have been tracking with our Featured Artist of the Month, you're going to realize in there that I have a Featured Artist of the Month for April, not for May, or sorry, for March, not for April, and now I have one for May. We changed our time on when the Featured Artist of the Month comes up, and now it's like the third week in a month. So it feels weird to say they're the Featured Art of the, Artist of the Month for a certain month when they're only there for a week in that month, but three weeks in a different month. So I have shifted it by a month. And so I'm saying May. It is also the very end of April, but it's May mainly. So that's moving forward. Just know that that's why I'm off by a little bit. Okay. Um, uh, On to the artist. So Denise uh, specializes in batik art. And if you've never heard of that before, uh, it's a wax resist method of dyeing fabric. Uh, And so uh, Denise gets into explaining how it works and the different methods you can do and the different styles that you can create with it. But it's fascinating what you have to do because you have to, I know in most art, you're uh, visualizing the end before you get there. But in batik, you actually kind of have to work backwards in what you're trying to accomplish. And, And because you're using wax and it's hot wax and it's drippy and stuff, if you make a mistake, then it's there. So you can't like undo it just by like scraping the wax off, like it's going to be like that. So um, we get into all of that and more. We get into what she does when she does make a mistake. Uh, And um, and then she's also had a pretty cool journey of getting to where she is and how she does what she does. Um, She's gone through some uh, physical uh, medical things that have, um, you know, were pretty scary at times, but um, has continued to persevere through all of that. So Anyways, the artwork that you will see here up in the loft, again, it's through the third week in May, so be sure to stop by and see it before then. Um, and this is May 2022 for those listening in the future. Um, but it, it, they're really neat and unique in how they uh, are done. And she has one piece that is of this like mountain trail, like a ridge line. Uh, it's beautiful, and it's so cool. Uh, and I love the way that the batik art looks when it's all complete. So um, I'm going to stop talking now. Um, uh, thank you again for listening to the podcast. And uh, without further ado, here's my conversation with Denise Camp- Campin. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Camino Voice. Today I'm here with the featured artist of the month for April and part of May um, in the loft. Welcome to the podcast, Denise Campin. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. So before we get started, tell us a little bit about Denise. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm a wife and a mom and a grandma, and I'm here because I'm an artist. Very cool. Awesome. So where did you grow up? Um, actually, I was born in Kirk, or in Seattle, and I grew up in the Kirkland, Juanita area. Okay. And um, yeah, the youngest of five girls and busy household. Yep. Yep. Okay. So what was that like growing up in that area for you? 
Oh, it was so fun. We had a great neighborhood. We had a little bit of acreage on a hill of forested land. Oh, so nice. we played down there in the trails and, you know, you could ride your bike through the neighborhood and yeah, different times. Yeah, well, a lot <laughs> different because Kirkland was not is not like that anymore. No, not at all. So, yeah, what's it like going back to your childhood house then, driving by it? Oh, so different. <laughs> I mean, we were up off of Money to Drive, so that area really hasn't changed. The homes that were there were, are still there and, okay. and hasn't really been changed. But the whole area in general, even the roads we took to go to school and all those, they're all rerouted and <laughs> yep. it's very different. Yeah, very cool. Um, so then, uh, when did you first get started in art? You know, really in school. I mean, I always loved it, you know, coloring, all that when I was real little. And then in school, I just really loved it when we would have art time, even in elementary school. Okay. Um, I would enter contests. My, my first win was I entered a contest for the fire department and you had to make some kind of poster. And I remember winning for the school and getting to go to the fire station and having a movie night and a tour. I was third grade. I was so excited. There's probably like 40, 50 kids I didn't know. Yeah. But I was just like, oh, this is this is good. And then um, in junior high, I took art when I could. There's only a few electives there. But then in high school, I, I squeezed in as many as I could with the electives. And really, that's where I really, you know, found it and loved it. Yeah. So what style of art were you... St- did you get started in? Mostly drawing um, pencil and uh, and then painting with like acrylic and oil. Um, then um, we were working on just different projects to the school. They In high school, they had a, a class called Rebel Graphics where you actually did things that hung around the school. It's like murals and, and banners and things like that. And so I got exposed to a lot of participating in other ones. I made batik banners, but I got to participate in like painting some of the mural, that kind of thing. Okay. So our teacher was amazing. He was actually a very accomplished artist, but he had a young family at the time that he was raising. So he was teaching also, and we all got the win out of that. He, um, I mean, he's still out there. His name's Lee Bogle and his work is incredible. Um, I mean, just beyond. And so it, we were just so blessed to have had him for a teacher. I can't even, you know, express how much he impacted our lives. There's yeah. so many people that still follow him on Facebook and everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. What was his specialty in art? Well, at the time, I really didn't know. I knew he did amazing oil paintings, and I knew he, you know, he was the one that taught me how to batik. So, he, I, and he was doing pottery at that time, too. So, he just did it all. Just okay. amazing. Very cool. Um, so as you were kind of going through high school and going through all of that then, what, um, was it something that you had thought about as far as like career paths and stuff like that as you were getting out of high school or were you kind of more focused on just getting, you know, to the next step or whatever? I really wanted to continue on with it. I, um, I mean, I loved it. I just loved it. And I, I mean, I was the kid that took the board home and the extra supplies home and, you know, worked at home with it. Um, but I didn't really understand how to make that happen. I, okay. didn't really un- I didn't really understand how do you go from here, how do you get into college with scholarships or grants. I, I didn't understand how that all worked and how who to ask and how to get there. Um, so I, um, you know, I didn't go that path, but I did um, get married very young and started my family after high school. And, um, and I did other jobs. I did jobs like um, bookkeeping, getting things ready for small companies. I'd only have to work like eight hours a week and get things ready to send off to a CPA. Yep. But mostly I was a stay-at-home mom. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So during, your, um, during that time period then, did, did art just kind of take a back seat? It did. It did in, in some ways. I always had something I could do. I okay. mean, I always had a drawing board. I had pencils or pens and and paint and I always had something and so and then I learned to like crochet and knit things like that it was like I had to be doing something and um I didn't really think about it at the time looking back I see that I did that common thread but um yeah life got busy and I uh I by the time I had been married like 10 years I started working outside the home more and um and then 
about at 12 years, we, we went through a separation and I was raising the kids alone. So I opened a daycare in my home. Okay. And um, so, of course, craft time was the best. Yep. But, um, <laughs> wow. but other than that, you know, I was needing to make income and be home with my, I had four kids. So. Yeah. Um, and I, I did have a few seasons. Like I had an opportunity in... Um, with our church, they wanted banners to be made. Okay. And they, all they had was certain specifications. They didn't really have any, so it was like this size, this thing, blah, blah, blah. And so I made this huge boutique banner of a woman worshiping and another one of a man worshiping. And um, that was so much fun because it was like, oh, yes. But the it was a lot of space and it, like I had to move everything aside, you know, and, and get it out and do it and then put everything away. And it, you know, it took a few weeks to do this. And so by the time that was done, I was like, I was using my bathtub to do the dyeing, you know. I mean, it was just so much cleanup that I, uh, I thought, ah, uh, not really the right season for this. But okay. yeah, I still loved it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so you've mentioned it a couple times in, in here. Uh, and so I want to jump into a little bit. Um, what is batik and, and how would you describe that? Okay. Batik is a wax resist method of dyeing fabric. Okay. So the way I do it is I, I use cotton, 100% cotton, and I transpose an image onto my cotton. So like if I want to do that, uh, I might hang the cotton up on the wall and project it, the image on and trace it with a graphite pencil. I might just lay the fabric down in front of me and draw an image or I might use the whole graph pattern you know and and put the image on but I get it onto the fabric and then um, you take melted wax okay. which is different ratios so you use a beeswax and a paraffin usually some people use soy wax um, and you blend it so depending on how you blend it you get crackle or no crackle or a little bit of crackle and you then wax the heat the wax, and then you paint the wax onto the areas you want to remain white, the color of the fabric. Okay. And then you go into your um, lightest color. So if you're going to go with pale yellow, you would then dye the fabric pale yellow. And then you go through a process, you dyed it, and it takes certain times of how long you leave it in for what the color will be. And then you put it through a soak that removes any excess dye. Okay. Rinse it, dry it, and then you're ready to put another layer of wax on. So then you wax those areas that you want to have pale yellow. Okay. So now you have sealed in your white. It didn't take any yellow on, and now you got your yellow. And then you do the next color. Um, let's say you're going orange, then red, then maybe a deep purple or something. But you work your way from light to dark. Okay. And then when you've done your last color, you then, um, you don't have to wax it in. You put your fabric between newsprint and you iron out all the extra wax. And then you have just a little bit of residue left. You take it to the dry cleaner and the regular dry cleaning process removes the residue. Okay. Some people boil it out. They'll put the batik all filled with wax. They'll put it in like a big crab pot with a, you know, propane tank and yeah. you boil it. And then you have a bucket to rinse it in cold and then kind of peel off all the extra stuff and then boil it again and I've done that it, it's um really messy and a lot of work <laughs> I prefer the dry cleaner um <laughs> but you can do that too yeah and and I think I've heard it's easier to do the boil out with um silk when you're doing like people that make the scarves and things that okay. the boil out some reason it's easier with that so, yeah. yeah okay very cool and um you had mentioned that some of your first exposure to this was actually in high school oh totally yes so what how did they I guess when you went to art class then, did they get, did they say, hey, here's the, all the different mediums you can use or were they just like try all of these things? Oh my gosh, we had the best art department. We had so many different classes. So there was actually a class for a batik and, but we had this huge open concept art room. It was, um, when he had a high school back in the day, it was all open concept. Now they've, okay. cl they've closed it in, they have classrooms, but they had this huge open concept it was like being in the back of a costco warehouse and yeah. there was just like there's the guys doing pottery and there's the guys over there doing woodwork and there's the painters and there's this batik area and so the process they did was they had big five gallon buckets of dye so like if there wasn't a color made you could request and get that color made um and it would be in a five gallon bucket and we reused those buckets um so 
we had, you know, big areas to stretch in our work. We had massive tables. I mean, it was just so open and wonderful. But yeah. you're working next to people who were doing their thing, you know, with painting or drawing. And yeah. it was just so much fun. Yeah. So what drew you to Batik then? You know, I don't really um, remember not liking it. I, I just loved it immediately. It was like, I don't know what it was. It was It's just kind of fascinating because... It's not as controlled as, oh, I don't like this area here. It's not white enough. I'm going to make it whiter. No, what you decided early, that's what it is. <laughs> and um, so it's fun that way. Yeah. And, um, and it, it's just, it's challenging in its own way. And you have to think it through like, okay, if I put this red on, I'm not really going to be able to, you know, go back to yellow or yeah. what you're doing. I, I like all that. I like that. And I really love the way it looks. Um, when I was learning, there was a lot of crackle. Crackle was like what people wanted. So when the wax was on there and you put it into the dye, I mean, we were using five gallon buckets, so we're kind of squishing it up and putting it in yeah. there. Now, when I came back to Batik, it's like, oh, it's so pristine. There's like there's no crackle. What's going on? You know, but um, so the style changes and then it also okay. changes. Uh, with what it is. Some people, you know, still do a ton of crackle with what they want and, um, and other work you look and, you know, it's almost none. Yeah. So it's just fun. Yeah. So what does that, um, did you feel like, uh, I guess, do you currently feel like uh, Batik plays into your personality trait? Like, are you more of like a planner and scheduler or are you kind of off the, wherever? Oh, that's so funny. I'd never thought of that before. Um, I think it does fit in. <laughs> I am a planner. I, I like to know what's going to happen and how and when and what. Yeah. And, um, oh, definitely, that's my personality. So okay. that's funny. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just, you know, you talk to a lot of different artists and they're all, you know, they just have such a wide ranging, uh, you know, assortment of personalities and stuff. And I feel like a lot of them, um, you kind of get this feel that they're like, can never be tied down and like oh. they're just going to be onto the next thing or they're they're just going to take it as it comes and so um <laughs> if they're you know especially like if you're doing watercolor like oh. you have this idea and then it changes because the water ran a different way than you expected mm -hmm. and then they adapt and they change that so you don't get to plan out your whole thing you get an idea but it, you have to be very fluid with it yes um. yes yeah and and that's true too with batik especially it, it can like do some doozies on you where you die. When I was first getting back into it, I, I was just like having trouble with my dye, and um, you go through this soak that you do to t remove the excess dye. Everything was removing. It, it was going back to white. I'm oh, like, no. <laughs> what is going on? And I was being frugal, so I was just trying it with this one color, and okay, and I'm making sure I'm doing the chemicals. You had some chemicals and stuff. So making sure I'm doing all the ratios right and the salt right and all this stuff you do. And, and it was disappearing. <laughs> and it turned out I had dead dye, which I didn't know was such a thing. So, okay. you know, so it does do surprises on you where you're going, oh, that didn't work. And even just recently, I was doing a, a shirt that I had just for fun for myself. And I did a, a deep red on it. That red is still coming out. I mean, it, it's like something happened with this red where it didn't, um, the additive that makes it fix to the fabric yeah. didn't take. So it's just leaching out. I have soaked it so many times. So I'm like, hmm, that was a fail. But it was just a shirt. It yeah. wasn't, <laughs> wasn't a big painting. So. Yeah. So how, do you, how have you kind of had to adjust with that on like some of these big paintings when you've had different things happen? Yeah, that's a good question. Sometimes you change... Um, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with, with batik. So even a drip, like if the wax, and when you're bringing the wax from the pan to where you're going to put it, even a drip, you know, boom, it's on there. And so then you might have to change your pattern a little bit or change, you know, oh, okay, now we got a dot here. How are we going to make that fit into yeah. what I have? Um, and so you do some, you do adapting um, when that happens, because okay. it, it can it can be very frustrating. Sometimes you just start over, depending on how critical that spot was. You just okay. start over, um, and then you say, okay, that was that was a learning one, and you know, there's a pile of learning ones over there. They're definitely, and uh, they're a lot of fun too, though, because then you can then once you've messed it up, then you can say, ooh, you know, I want to learn this technique, and so you use it on those, and okay. and you play with it and learn from it. So it it it's good and bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
It kind of gives you that freedom. Yeah. So with batik, are those um, are they typically more abstract designs, or are you usually building from something else, from what you're aiming for? You know, what I do is is pictures. So I have always done like when I younger, I did a lot of people, um, okay. a lot of people, and um, this time around when I got into it, I started going into, I, I, it had been years, so I just started up again, um, that's kind of a story in itself, but I um, started up again, and it was like, these flowers were fascinating me, and it was, it was the center of the flower that was fascinating me, and it was, I just was zooming in on this daisy, and there's the Fibonacci sequence, it, it's kind of like what a snail has, yeah. and golden rule, and all this kind of thing it's called. And it, it's just beautiful. And so I was zooming in on that, and I wanted to capture that. So I made these huge daisies, and I just, you know, that was like, whoa, this is really cool. I was looking at what else can I zoom in on? What else can I see? And, and so it was really colorful, bright, and a lot of flowers. And um, I'm also really into trees. I love doing trees. So I'm still kind of developing where do I want to be, what do I want to do, I have like three with people that I'm working on, but I don't have any completed ones with people right now. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I think I answered. <laughs> yeah, no, no, for sure. So yeah, you definitely, you, you aim more towards a, like you're trying to picture either flowers or whatever. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it, it, it's not, yeah, it's not just patterns. I mean, for here, I was asked to make some um, linens for the holidays. Okay. And so those were interesting as far as like, okay, you know, I've never, haven't done this. So I, I would, some of them are just kind of patterns and fun and, and there's only two sets left. And so one is some trees and the other one is just some, you know, patterns. Okay. But, um, I did make some for April that are just pink with polka dots because she was like spring bright, you yeah. know? So I was like, oh okay, I could do that. So I just made some fun ones that, nice. you know, kind of be there too. All right. Very cool. So yeah, getting back to your story then. Um, so you were raising kids. Um, at what point along that did you kind of, were you finally able to maybe open up a little more space in your schedule to start getting back into art? Okay, that was, yeah. So I, I had the daycare and then my kids were obviously growing up. And when my youngest one was 14 and in high school, I closed the daycare and, and thought, you know, I want to go work out there, see what I could do and tried yeah. a few things and then uh, really landed on being a nanny. Okay. And fell in love with that. So I had these fantastic families and uh, worked for them. And then um, during that time, my health started to change and wasn't sure what was going on. Um, went in and had a lot of tests and found out that I have an adult onset form of muscular dystrophy. Okay. So um, I was able to continue working four more years before my muscles got to where they couldn't quite do that work anymore. It wasn't safe, couldn't evacuate kids, that kind of thing. And I had to stop working. And at that point I was really spent. I mean, physically spent because I really didn't want to stop working. Yeah. And so I really pushed it to where I just worked and slept, worked and slept. And that's why my doctor said, okay, enough. <laughs> but um, anyway, so um, that first year turned out to be amazing. As scary as it was to like, how is this going to work? Um, I just took that time and I rested and I learned about this disease and I learned how to do things to save energy mm -hmm. and um, my stamina was really low, my energy was really low, but a few months into just a lot of resting, maybe six, seven months into it, I was getting the hang of it. Okay, this is how I can do it. This is, and at this time my kids are all out of the house, I'm living alone and um, so there wasn't a lot of demands on me to... Mm -hmm. Hey, mom, do this or that. Yeah. And so I really had a lot of time to rest. Yeah. And then I, uh, during that time, I also met um, a wonderful man, and you met him a minute ago, and we started dating. It was about a year after I'd been diagnosed. And then a year after that, we got married. Yeah. And about four years into that, the first ever treatment was FDA approved for the um, SMA, which is the form of muscular dystrophy I have. There'd okay. never been a treatment all these wow. decades and decades. Wow. And that first one was there. And um, so I, I went to my neurologist and said, you know, tell me about this and educate me. And then I knew I wanted it. And 
he told me, you just keep, we're not giving it here at the UW yet, but you be the squeaky wheel. So I'm like, okay. And I found out everything I had to do and, and I'd tell him and he'd say, okay, and he'd order that test and that whatever evaluation. So when they were ready, um, I got the treatment. Yeah. And so I've been on that treatment for four years and it took about eight doses. So as into the second, the end of the second year, um, where my stamina started to increase. Okay. And then the progression of muscle loss started to really slow down where I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm gaining more energy. I'm able to do things. Wow. I wasn't able to stand up from a kayak and, um, or stand up if I was on the floor, um, I needed help. So it was amazing. I could stand up again and yeah. I was just like, wow. And then as that happened, I started having energy to like, Oh, I want to get back into this art. I want to get creative again. I want to, so I was drawing and um, I had like these ceramic tiles we picked up and porcelain paints and then you paint on them these whimsical like rabbits and things. I've always loved rabbits and you cure them and then they're like permanent. So I started making stuff like that, just yep. having fun. And at the same time, um, there was... Uh, artist on Facebook that was saying, you know, asking questions like, you know, what are you doing with your creativity? You know, how are you using this? And I, I started listening to him and, and following him. He had a podcast and then he had like a three or four day event. I can't remember uh, how many days and it was free. And so I signed up for that and it was like, it was kind of like a Zoom thing, but a different platform. And so I'm doing that and I'm thinking, this is really fun. I'm loving it. And then, of course, the offer, you know, it's all a plan. Yep. So yep. his marketing was real good. <laughs> and so he, he put out the offer to join his mentoring group. So I talked over to my husband. I said, you know, I really, I'm loving this. And he goes, you are loving this. He's watching what I'm doing and how happy I am about it. And he goes, go for it, go for it. So I did. I jumped in and joined the group. And um, it's just been amazing. I mean, through that group, they have meetups. And so that's how I met, found this place. Lydia that works for you hosted a meetup here at the loft. Yeah. And so I met her and, and I think there was nine of us or so. And, yeah. and so I met everybody there and it was just so fun. And then from there, she offered me to do the linens and, you know, the holiday uh, sale. Yeah. And then I brought my... I really had never done those and she wanted muted colors and things. And so I had to learn how to dye muted colors and all these <laughs> things I didn't know, but I just did it. And then when I brought them, I brought what she asked for, but then I brought some of my work yeah. <laughs> that I love. Yeah. And I was like, so she's like looking at my, my linens and she's like, great, great. And then I said, and can I show you what I really love to do? Yeah. And then she was like, oh, and so from there I got invited to have some work shown here in April. Yes. That's awesome. <laughs> Very cool. So um, then in this whole process, uh, do you now have your own studio area in your house to oh, be able yeah. to do all this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now it's so wonderful. So the whole what used to be a garage and then a family room and a daycare <laughs> and all this is my studio. Okay. So it's been so fun. Just took that space over and it is totally, yeah, packed full. And then, I mean, it was such a blessing because even through those years of doing the daycare and being a nanny, there was, like I said, always some kind of project I was doing. And so those families that either I took care of their children in my home or that I worked for in their home, they all knew I loved doing art. Yeah. And so when it was like Christmas or my birthday, they would give me gift cards. And so I had really nice art supplies. And um, I had, most of them were still pristine. I'd use them a little bit, but I just didn't have the time or the stamina. Yeah. So. Um, once that came, I had all these beautiful things. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm getting everything out and using it and just so excited. And so my husband was all on board. Um, and another friend was like, hey, we're, we're no longer needing these big tables. I had these huge art tables that got donated. And things just kept coming. Yeah. Kept coming to us. Even last week, um, I picked up a mat cutter that somebody said, you know, I heard you're doing this. And you know, I'd like you to have this. And I'm like, wow. I mean, it just keeps coming in. Yeah. So it's like, I mean, really practical things. And then of course, some of the things that I had in there before I decided to make it a studio space yeah. were things from old, you know, things from 
the daycare years that were just like, oh, so fun, and the memories, but it was no longer the season. Yep. So I was able to pack up a lot of those, and I have a friend that works at a school in Kent and, and just say, hey, can you guys use these? And they have a, a non-outside recess room yep. that they took those things. So that felt good, knowing it's going to be used by kids again. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but the only, yeah, so the, the studio space is great. The only thing is we had to kind of divide our kitchen. We have one of those double sink kitchen sinks. And yep. I'm like, okay, this side is batik. And <laughs> next to it is my big soaking bucket. And luckily I have a very chill husband who's like, okay, go for it, you know. <laughs> and so that's, it comes into the kitchen a little bit. But yep. other than that, it's in the studio. That's awesome. <laughs> very cool. So when did you actually really uh, start picking it up again then? Because it sounds like it was fairly recent. Very recent. I joined the group um, in October of 2020. Okay. And I was doing the tiles, the little whimsical tiles, and wasn't really sure where I wanted to go. I could paint, I could do things. And Batik was, I had a Batik area of supplies, but I was nervous about it. I hadn't done it in a long time. And I was like, what's changed? How do I learn? And over the years, I had tried to reach out. There was a couple times... I mean, when I did it for the banners, that was great. And then about 10 years later, a couple of years after that, I tried to like, I want to get into this again. And I couldn't find places that were teaching it. And I, I would search even school districts, like, are they teaching it? Can I go help? Can I go sit in and, and just see the new techniques or get back into it? And nothing. There was all closed doors. Mm-hmm. And I was really like, even um, some other friends and my daughter were searching and, oh, I found a class, mom. And we look it up and it's like, oh, that closed three years ago. Okay. You know, we missed it. But um, so it was just dead ends. Well, during COVID, I had joined that program and I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to search you something just so search again, search again. Yeah. So I searched and I went into Facebook groups. There was like seven groups. I'm like, what? <laughs> and so I start looking through these and the first two were so good. I just joined those two and stopped looking because I was like, oh, overload. But it was so fun. I was I, One of them is about more techniques. Okay. And so that one I, I looked at and I just saw the feedback people were giving. I thought, okay, I'm going to see if I'll join that one. The other one was more um, the paintings. And so I was like, okay, I'm looking through it and I start seeing the work I want to be able to do. Yeah. And I was like, whoa. So I'm hitting like, you know, and I'm scrolling and you know, like, ooh, love, ooh, like, ooh, love. And then I start noticing I'm seeing the same name over. And I'm like, oh, I keep liking this person's work over and over. And I was like, wow. And so then I looked at, um, I looked online for that name and found that they have a gallery and all this. And I was just like so impressed. A few minutes later, this message comes in to me and it says, hey, Denise, are we related? And it was that artist. And I'm like, you know, and I realized my maiden name is his last name. So okay. his name's Jonathan Evans, and his wife is Beth Evans. Phenomenal batik artist. Okay. Oh, my gosh. And so we start talking on Messenger, and then um, he offers to, hey, you know, I'm here if you have questions. I, I, I'm a teacher. I love, you know, I've been doing this. He has actually been doing batik without stop since I learned in high school and I'm going to be 60 on the weekend here. So we're talking decades, you know, he has been doing it. He's in his seventies and he has been just doing batik, batik, batik. And so, so impressive. And then his wife, um, I'm not sure when, I think they've been together like 20 years. I'm not sure how many years, but she is phenomenal. He even says she's better than him when he talked to me. On He ended up offering to, you know, help me. And we had like an hour long phone call. Wow. So nice. I asked him if I could take classes, you know, online with him, but he is in a part of Colorado with really bad reception. He said it just is too hard, but they offer him in their, um, in their home. They have a studio and a gallery. And so they offer him there. They're very busy giving classes. Yeah. And so hopefully in a couple of years when my husband retires, we head on down there nice. <laughs> and take the class. That's awesome. He's so amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. And I love that about, um, the artist community. I find, um, that there, if there's this, this thing of, um, they're able to share this information because, uh, art artists in the base form, like is this journey. And so, 
you guys continue to master and learn these techniques and all th these things of what your focus is on, but then you can only get to so far because you know at some point we all die. Yeah. So then you're looking for that next generation to pass that torch on so that they can carry that farther. And I just, it's such a great uh, aspect of that, that they continue to do that. Oh, and um, the generosity. You know, most of the people I've met that are working as artists, part-time or full-time, part are just so generous with what they know. The majority of them will say, I could ask a question and they will just totally tell me, you know, well, you know, when I did it, I went through this and this and this and save you steps that yeah. you just, you know, they don't want to see you go through because you right. can avoid them. Yeah. And then you can get out there quicker and, and, you know, show what you can make. Yeah, that's very cool. So um, what are some new skills? I you know, especially with, uh, with, like, with Jonathan of what he does, I guess what aspect of what he does stands out to you as that's the next level that you really want to work towards? The detail, the detail that he gets and the subtlety of his colors, they are incredible. There was one face that he did. He'd lived in India at a time, and there was this face he had done, and somebody asked a question about it and there was like 70 colors on this batik. Wow. And when you looked real close, it was just the subtle little changes. Um, oh my gosh, it just blew my mind. Yeah. And then there's also technique that I haven't mastered. Um, it'll take years to master, but that I haven't even really gotten good at that where you can put the, uh, the cold and the warm colors smack next to each other with just a very fine line. A lot of people will trace everything with white, you know, they'll trace everything with hot wax. Yep. And so everything you look at has a white line around it. Uh, but there's another method where you end up with a dark line around it because you've done your colors just so that when they bleed together, yeah. you know, it's a muddy. And then when you do your final, it can be black yeah. um, or dark blue or whatever. Yeah. But, um, there's all, when I look at some of their work, I can't even see the line. And wow. I'm like, how do they do this? That's the kind of thing I want to be able to do. When, I, when I'm looking, oh. And there's a gal named Rosie Robinson okay. who's out of the U.K. And she comes to the States and, and teaches. But she's amazing. She can make water look like water. And you're like, the ripples, the dock. She has this one by the dock. She has people where you think it's a photograph. These You're like, what in the world? Wow. Yeah, so it's it's amazing yeah. what's out there and how you know that, wow, with time, it's, you know, it's just going to get better and better. Yeah, that's awesome. So um, tell me about the pieces that you're planning on bringing to the loft. So I'm, I have some flowers mostly. Um, Let's see. Oh, and rabbits. I love rabbits. I okay. love, I just do. I, I had one as a kid. Maybe that's part of it. I had a pet. <laughs> but I just love rabbits. But I really like the wild, like the jackrabbit look with the really huge ears yeah. and all that and the long legs. So I have a few rabbits I've done and then a lot of flowers. Okay. And then um, because it's an island, I did a couple starfish and... Um, Seems like I did something else. I'm trying to think. There's one more that's kind of islandy, but I can't quite remember right now. <laughs> okay. No, that's great. Awesome. Well, um, I like to end every podcast with some rapid fire questions. Okay. So the first one is, what purchase of $100 or less have you enjoyed the most in the last three months? Goodness. Okay. That was a hard, that's hard. I got a couple things I did. I, I guess one of them is there's a company called Primally Pure, okay. and they, they sell just, what like it sounds, very pure products for hygiene. And, um, and so we use the soaps and deodorants and stuff. But then I just decided, yeah, I'm going to splurge a little with this birthday decade thing coming up. And so I bought some of their, um, some extra products from them. And, oh, and, and they're just also awesome at their packaging when you get their package it feels like you're opening a present they package everything so well yeah. you're like this is amazing yeah so you know that's i've been enjoying that very cool all right who is the most influential person outside of your family in your life currently that would be matt tommy he has the mentoring program that i joined and because of the influence and because of the program um i'm sitting here with you today it has just it's changed how i how i schedule my week how I see myself as an artist, how I feel bold enough to go out there and say, this is where I am now, and I'm excited where I'm going. Yeah. And um, 
it's just been so fun. Just so fun. Yeah. Yeah. So Very he's cool. he's been it. Awesome. All right. This is a fill in the blank question. And it's, I know this is weird, but I've always wanted to blank. <laughs> I'm glad you started with it's weird. I, it is weird. I've always wanted to visit Crater Lake in okay. Oregon. But I want to go down to the lake. And right now when I read online, it's not ADA accessible. So we got some changes to make. But I want to go down there and I want to get in a boat with my husband, just the two of us. And I want to float out to the middle of the lake and anchor on a really clear, warm summer night and fall asleep under the stars. It's, I love the stars and I love it when you're way out. Like I was in Utah one time and coming through at night and it was just massive. No city, nothing, you know, you're just in the boonies and it was just incredible. So I want to combine that love of stars and Crater Lake. That's awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Well, I hope you get to do that someday. Me too. Um, who is an interesting or fascinating person that I should interview next? I was. I think that uh, I don't know the person myself, but I think if you were to find a local art teacher that works in one of the high schools around here mm -hmm. and ask them to pick maybe four or five students that really are passionate about art, maybe not the best students, but the ones that really have that passion, Yeah. and come in and, and, and just have a conversation about how the art teacher sees a future for them and how they see a future. Do they see art continuing? What obstacles do they have? Do they... Um, you know, what roads do they see open? What what help do they need? I mean, I wish I had had that. Yeah. So I'd love to, like, see somebody else get that yeah. and, and have that. Very cool. All right. And lastly, what piece of advice would you give your 20-year-old self? Oh, my. Yeah. My 20-year-old self. I would I'd look at her and I would tell her, go out there and ask for help. Ask for help with the things that aren't working right. Ask for help with the things you want to add to your life that aren't here. Ask and keep asking. If, if you get shut down, find somebody else and keep finding and keep asking. And you can have that dream and the life you have and merge them together. You yeah. can do it. It can fit. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Um, yeah, that's what I would tell her. Yeah, I think that's great. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. And Islanders, I will talk to you on the next one. Well, a big thank you to Denise Campen for joining me on the podcast today. And thank you for listening. If you haven't already, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform. It really helps us be found by other Islanders like yourself. And for more information on this episode, you can go to commandocommons.com slash podcast. That's commandocommons.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening and see you next time.